Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mike Shanahan, Chairman of the HMC Board of Trustees. Welcome to the 46th Annual Commencement Ceremony of Harvey Mudd College, which is now in session. Please remain standing for the National Anthem. Would you please remain standing for a few moments of silence to reflect on the significance of this ceremony in light of the extraordinary events of the past year? Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The ceremony this afternoon honors the students who have successfully completed a rigorous program of academic study as required by the faculty of the college. Before that, however, it is altogether fitting that the graduates to be recognized and honor the family and friends who have come to share this day with them. I ask the graduates to rise and turn to you with a standing ovation in appreciation for all the support they have received. Thank you, members of the class of 2004. I call President Strauss to the podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I ask the trustees and faculty of Harvey Mudd College to stand so that we may recognize them for in their involvement in Harvey Mudd College and for making today's ceremony possible.
Thank you. Now, the class of 2004 has already stood to recognize their parents and friends, but now let's ask them to stand and be recognized for the achievements that brought them here today. Class of 2004. Thank you. We will now award the Henry T. Mudd Prize. In 1992, the college began a tradition of recognizing during commencement one who has contributed greatly to generations of students and to Harvey Mudd College. The first recipient of the Henry T. Mudd Prize was President Emeritus, Professor Emeritus, and Honorary Trustee, Joseph Platt. By tradition, the selection of the awardee is done in secret, and the recipient is not informed until just now. Today, we will carry on in that tradition by recognizing another among us who, through dedication and activities such as teaching, curriculum development, research, and administrative skill, has exemplified the generosity and spirit that Henry Mudd devoted to the college. The honoree will receive a $4,000 award, 2,000 of which is designated for use within the college at the discretion of the awardee. The citation reads, the Henry T. Mudd Prize, 2004. For his exemplary service to Harvey Mudd College over many years, during which he has served with dedication, passion, and skill, for his selfless commitment to the mission and quality of this institution, for his efforts to recruit outstanding colleagues, for his supportive leadership of a great variety of academic program initiatives, and for his major role in developing external grant funds that have had such wonderful effects on our academic program. Now, it is appropriate that I pause here in the reading of the citation to provide some brief background. Although the HTM prize winner is a secret, Generally, by this time in the reading, the citation, most recipients have figured out that I'm referring to them. <laughs> this year's recipient, however, is a member of the selection committee and knows very well that we elected someone other than he. The simple fact of the matter, however, is that the rest of the selection committee had a subsequent double secret vote <laughs> and selected F. Sheldon Weddock, Dean of Faculty, hereby designated as the 2004 recipient of the Henry T. Mudd Prize. That is a surprise. I knew it would be a surprise. A certificate. And, of course, the check. Sheldon, would you care to... Say a word or two. Literally, I'm blown away. I was on that selection committee. My faculty colleagues know how much I love this place. I've told them the last 11 years have been the best years of my professional life, and I really mean that. I hope all the rest of you realize that I mean it as I say it now. Uh, this is a great place. I've enjoyed being the dean, and as I leave the deanship and move back to the faculty, I'm excited about the prospect of, of being a, a faculty member and joining you down in those seats in a subsequent year. Thanks very, very much. Well, congratulations, Sheldon. I would like now to introduce our speaker from the graduating class, Colin Jamat. <laughs> Colin is graduating with a degree in engineering and a specific interest in systems and control engineering. He plans to work for his clinic sponsor, UVP in Upland, over the summer. And then Colin will attend Boston University in the fall to pursue a master's degree. During the past four years, Colin has contributed his skills to many Harvey Mudd programs. He has served as the Student Government Social Chair, the Mixology Club President, I don't know what that's all about, and recently headlined the Rocky Horror Show. 
And last summer, Colin investigated why curveballs work in the new engineering wind tunnel for Professor Rossman. In his spare time, Colin has a 1974 GMC truck and a 1959 Austin Healey Sprite that he tries to keep running. The class of 2004 is pleased to have this eclectic scholar represent them today. Ladies and gentlemen, Colin Jamont. Thank you. An experience this past summer drove me to think seriously about my time at MUD. I'd done my share of uh, critical thinking about my college experience before then, but talking to a recent alumnus about what to try to make of my senior year convinced me that I had a long way to go. My frost year, I proved to myself that I could make it through MUD, both academically and socially. Sophomore year, I learned the hard way that you can have too much fun for your own good. <laughs> Junior year, I applied myself academically and in student government and proved to myself that I could do that as well. I was on the verge of my senior year, and I'd seen most of what Harvey Mudd could throw at me. This alumnus gave me the hardest and most meaningful assignment I've had this year. He told me to make peace with Mudd before I left. We need to reflect on what this all meant, what parts to take with us, and concurrently what we need to let go. This may seem like an odd thing to need to do, but I'm sure that the students graduating here today and the parents, faculty, and staff that have supported us understand that MUD is not what you might call easy on the psyche. The MUD experience is intense, to say the least. The lows can ruin you, but the highs can more than make up for it. Many students at MUD go through a period where they hate the school. For some, this lasts mere hours after a failed test. For others, it's long after graduation. But as counterintuitive as it may seem, many of these same students don't hesitate to call Harvey Mudd home. I feel many of these same conflicts in my thinking about Harvey Mudd. I'll never forget the sad look on my mother's face when I first referred to Mudd as home while I was visiting the house I grew up in. It was amazing how quickly this place became my home, and the reason is simple. It's the people. Have you ever been here in mid-August, once the summer math students have left and before orientation begins? It's desolate. Almost made me cry the first time I visited. And I realized that this place is just a collection of buildings, like hundreds of others in Los Angeles. It's the people who make it what it is. Unfortunately, <laughs> many of my favorite people have graduated, ITR'd, or left to teach elsewhere, and many more are graduating today. But I'm confident that we've left our mark, that the school is a better place for our having been here, much like we are better for having been through this. I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up, but I'm not afraid. Last year, Professor Sontag told me in my philosophy class that after graduating from Harvey Mudd College, we would have nothing to fear but God himself. Standing up here in front of all of you, I can tell you that's not true. <laughs> but the sentiment is right. Harvey Mudd has convinced me that any failure is temporary. One of the major reasons I wanted to speak here today was simply a chance to formalize my thoughts about Mudd. This process included a lot of revision. And as I got closer to the end of sem the semester and my work started to multiply, my sentences became more terse and the tone more abrasive. My attitude about Harvey Mudd, and in many ways the world in general, was affected for the worst. But all of this work was due more than a week ago. And since then, I've had time to sleep in, chat with friends, pick up the guitar, and think a lot more about this speech. And a funny thing happened. My thinking about Mudd and this speech really ended up being more upbeat than I meant it to. <laughs> the intensity of Harvey Mudd affects us all in different ways some of which are difficult to recognize. And in reflecting on what it all meant, we need to uh, keep, <laughs> we need to uh, keep what this tells us about Harvey Mudd and ourselves in mind. I came to Harvey Mudd expecting naively to be for truth and beauty alongside brilliant and curious students. What I found was different. But perhaps the biggest surprise was the discovery of people I've come to consider family. 
That surprise helped me to articulate what I want out of life. I know that's a pretty big claim, but I'll go one farther and claim that I've had it here at MUD. What I want is a job where they pay me to learn and where I'm surrounded by the people I love. It's that simple. My hope for the future is that I can find another place that fits this ideal as well as Harvey Mudd College has, where I will learn as much that I'm interested in and be surrounded by so many amazing people. Harvey Mudd College is in many ways a model community. Both academic and social problems are solved through rational debate, reflecting what I believe is one of the biggest benefits of science. Henry Collins described science as having a deep and sincere collective curiosity, generally free from the cynicism and pessimism which pervades the culture of academic social science. He went on to say that the natural sciences, when they are practiced with open-minded curiosity, are still the role model for all of us. The pursuit of truth and of being honorable are highly valued here at Harvey Mudd. However overwhelmed we may get at times to the point of forgetting it. We cannot forget that we have been handed all of this at the expense of others, not just through the dedicated work of our faculty and staff, but also our parents and countless others who have supported us. We must remember our debt to the world as we go off tomorrow. We are the best and the brightest because of those who have sacrificed much for us. Let's thank them now with applause. But also remember to honor them through thought and action as we go out into the world. I believe that Harvey Mudd has, in many ways, the most difficult and most rewarding position for undergraduate students. Mudd has taught me, paradoxically, that I can be a great engineer and that science is not the way to answer most of the important questions in life. The students here are dedicated to their technical work but are given enough of a taste of the humanities and are bright enough to know that all is not right with the world and that technology in itself is not any kind of solution. Harvey Mudd likes to say it's training its students to not pursue their technical work in a vacuum. I'd like to encourage that as we go off into the world today. I know the feelings I've expressed here are conflicting, incomplete, and in no way universal. I encourage you to meditate on your own experience in the coming weeks and months and come to your own conclusions. Make your peace with Harvey Mudd College. But whatever your current thoughts are, today is a day of celebration. We made it. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for those thoughtful remarks. And I'd like to add some more thanks here, and that is to all the members of the class of 2004 for your marvelous 78% participation and raising a total of almost $2,400 for your class gift of new furniture for the class of 2004 private dining room. It'll be in the new Hoke Shanahan Dining Hall here behind me, which is due to open for the beginning of the spring semester. It is now my pleasure to introduce our 2004 commencement speaker, Henry Petrosky, the Alexander S. Vesic Professor of Civil Engineering and Professor of History at Duke University. He received his bachelor's degree from Manhattan College in 1963, his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1968. Before going to Duke in 1980, he taught at the University of Illinois and the University of Texas and was a group leader at Argonne National Laboratory. He is a professional engineer registered in Texas and a chartered engineer registered in Ireland. Petros Professor Petrosky's current research activity focuses on the areas of failure analysis and design theory. Ongoing projects include the use of case histories to understand the role of human error and failure in engineering design, as well as the development of models for invention and evolution in the engineering design process. His research has been sponsored by the Corps of Engineers, the National Science Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and other organizations, and he's published over 70 referee journal articles. Professor Petrosky is the author of the book, 
to engineer as human the role of failure in successful de design, and is the writer and presenter of the 1987 BBC television documentary, To Engineer as Human, which has been broadcast on the PBS. He also lectures widely and is interviewed frequently on radio and television. Professor Petrosky is a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Henry Petrosky. President Strauss, college trustees, deans, faculty, parents, guests, and especially today, students of the class of 2004. It is an honor to address you on this fine day in Southern California, but I understand that all days in Southern California are fine days. I have long admired the reputation of Harvey Mudd, and I'm pleased to have this opportunity to see your campus and learn more about your programs. From what I have seen and learned already, I can fully understand why you are so proud to be associated with this institution and so proud to be graduating today to join the ranks of its alumni and alumni. You are liberally educated engineers, scientists, and mathematicians. And as such, you are well prepared to help make the technological society in which you live more human and more humane. That's good, because technology can be hard-edged and dehumanizing if it is not softened with art and emotion. A few weeks ago, I visited the new Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown Los Angeles. And I think it is a wonderful example of how the hard edge can be taken off technological achievement without it being left any less effective. In fact, the technological achievement is enhanced by the artfulness of its execution. Frank Gehry's complex design might never have risen off the drawing board if it were not for the engineers and other technical professionals working in concert with the architect. The building was realizable because very sophisticated computer software was employed to size and fit together the underlying structural steel components of the leaning, undulating, and soaring masterpiece. That same software has been used to design warplanes. But in, the case, in this case, it was employed to evoke flower blossoms and tree trunks and other organic forms that present the visitor with comforting petal and leaf-like spaces and surfaces. Technology, it has often been observed, is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Technology and its tools are what we make of them. We can make weapons or we can make music halls. There is a time and a place and a need for both. The Disney Concert Hall's art and architecture may be more apparent than are its science and engineering, but the building relies on both to succeed. If you climb the outside stairway and follow its circuitous path around the building toward the rooftop garden, you come across a section of the building that the architect left unclad inside. Here you can see the underlying maze of straight structural parts that makes the curvy stainless steel facade possible. This inside glimpse of engineering may not be visible from the street, but from within the folds of the building, its essential role is apparent. It reveals the symbiotic relationship between architecture and engineering that Gary and his colleagues exploited to the benefit of Los Angeles and the world. Walt Disney Concert Hall is at the same time unique and representative of thoughtful architecture and engineering everywhere. Another fine city, Chicago, has some of the world's tallest and most renowned buildings. Among them are the John Hancock Building and the Sears Tower, the latter being once the tallest in the world and still the tallest in America. Both are the creation of fruitful collaboration between the architect, Bruce Graham, and the engineer, Fosler Kahn. Each of these buildings was a compromise between form and function and a daring departure from the norm for tall buildings of the time. 
The tapered John Hancock employs its signature diagonal steel members to give it stiffness against the wind. The unorthodox exposed structure was at first feared to be a liability when it came to renting out the floors. For who would want a large piece of structural steel slashing diagonally across a picture window view of the city or its lake? It turns out the uniqueness of the structure made the offices and apartments with the obstructing diagonals the most desirable, for they marked the space as being within the striking new building. The new structural form, employed initially strictly for technological reasons, became a coveted architectural distinction. Similarly, the Sears Tower was able to rise as tall as it does by the close coupling of structural engineering and architectural brilliance. The tower was really made up of nine square tubes. Individually, none of them could withstand Chicago's winds. But clustered together, each contributes to and benefits from the strength and stiffness of the others. But if that were all the Sears Tower was, it would be just a very tall but boring pack of glass boxes. What makes it much more than this is the simple architectural choice to terminate different tubes at different heights. This not only retains the efficient structural arrangement, but also gives the skyscraper its unique character. Like the mutually advantageous tubes of the Sears Tower, engineers, architects, and all sorts of professionals can make the sum of their contributions much greater than their individual ones. Gary, Graham, Kahn, and other contemporary architects and engineers and scientists with strong capacities working together change the look of things and so also change the way we look at things. Such creative individuals have strong humanistic and social sensitivities, which manifest themselves in what they design. They are individuals who recognize that they are part of a larger society, which their designs affect in significant ways. Every one of you graduating today has that same potential to affect society through technology. It is a responsibility not to be taken lightly. And each of you has the opportunity to express your own personality through your efforts. You are at the same time as similar and as different as the technological projects with which you will become involved. And that involvement will likely change several times during the course of your careers. It is not that you will not be able to make up your minds. It is that the world and its technology are changing so rapidly that what you will be 10, 20, 30, and more years out from now is as unknown and virtually unknowable today as what the buildings will look like then. But you are prepared for the future, whatever it is, because your Harvey Mudd education has taught you the underlying principles, not only of your profession and its technology, but also of your humanity. And it is by means of employing those principles that you will help shape the world of tomorrow. Although engineering and science are virtually synonymous with the latest technology, with pushing ahead with ever bolder efforts, their methods are also deeply rooted in the past. If an engineer like Leonardo or a scientist like Galileo were somehow, had somehow been able to be transported from the Renaissance to the present, he would naturally be amazed at the advances in modern technology. But at the same time, he would be able to understand fully the engineering and scientific method that brought these advances to pass. The constants of civilization, known as the engineering method and the scientific method, are in fact virtually indistinguishable from the methods of ages past and will remain indistinguishable in the future. This is not to say that engineers and scientists have identical and unchanging personalities. Instead, indeed, there are countless jokes that play on the differences. Do you know the one about the engineer, the scientist, and the mathematician who were asked to determine the volume of a rubber ball? Well, the mathematician used spherical coordinates and integral calculus to prove that the volume existed and was unique. So he saw no need to actually calculate it. The scientist placed the ball in a tub, measured the water it displaced, and applied Arch Archimedes' principle to estimate the volume within experimental error. The engineer 
found the model number stamped on the ball, and looked up its precise specifications, <laughs> including its volume in a catalog. Such inside jokes about problem solving do not make one profession superior or inferior to another. They merely show that ingenuity takes different forms. Whether you are a mathematician, a scientist, or an engineer, you can take pride in your special approach to problem solving. But using a theoretical, experimental, or practical approach to not, is not all that distinguishes engineering from science and mathematics. Theodore von Karman was educated as an engineer, but has often been called a scientist, indeed a rocket scientist. He was a pioneer in the field of aerodynamics and was a co-founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is associated with a little school not too far up the road from here. He is also credited with defining the difference between science and engineering. According to von Karman, science seeks to understand what is. Engineering seeks to create what never was. Thus, engineers create rockets, and scientists seek to uncover the principles by which they are propelled, which in turn helps engineers create improved rockets, which might call for more refined theories to understand. It might seem like a circular process, and it is. Engineering and science feed upon each other. Indeed, Engineering and science have been called mirror image twins because of this relationship between them. But real world problems seldom fall into neat, mutually exclusive categories of science or engineering. And neither do those who work on real problems. For engineers often find themselves doing science and scientists engineering. By extension, Real-life jobs seldom fall into perfectly neat classifications of scientist, mathematician, or engineer. We all end up working together, like Bruce Graham and Fosler Khan, especially on the more practical and meaningful problems of technology and society. In fact, in the end, no matter what your job title, most of us end up doing engineering of some form or another because we are very often asked to create something that does not exist. It could be a new type of building, or a new model ball, or a new system of airport security. It could be a new investment strategy, or a new way to power computers and cell phones. Not everything is new, of course, in which case we might be given the task of devising a new means of maintaining old machinery, or a new process for cleaning up a city's old polluted atmosphere. Whatever it is that you, and as an educated person in a technological age, end up doing, it is likely to involve creating something new. And creating something new means designing it. You have also learned a lot about design at Harvey Mudd, and that knowledge will serve you well throughout your career. You have learned that design means constraint and choice and compromise. If you are asked to design a new ball for a new market, you might be asked to devise one that bounces higher than any other, but does not cost any more to manufacture. Chances are you would have to choose among a variety of materials, with the most resilient also being the most expensive. In the end, you would have to compromise between high bounce and low cost. That is the way things are with design. That is the way the ball bounces. Or you may find yourself involved with less frivolous projects, say to design an energy efficient, pollution free automobile that will be as stylish and desirable as the best that Detroit, that Detroit has to offer today. Or to develop new energy sources that at the same time will be more environmentally friendly and make our country more energy independent. Such difficult design and development problems are only some of the challenges your generation faces. Accept those challenges and attack the problems with gusto. There is nothing teachers like better than to see their students excel in courses and in life. Design challenges and opportunities are ubiquitous. Whatever your major has been at Harvey Mudd, you will encounter design problems throughout your career and throughout your life. Planning your graduation day has been a design problem. You and your family and guests 
like all the rest of us, have been constrained by the schedule of events. We speakers have had to design our, our talks to fit within the time allotted to us. And I hope I have calculated the length of this speech correctly. <laughs> to meet the day's constraints, you have also had to make choices and compromises about when to leave home to get here on time, what roads to drive on to get here, what alternate routes to take if traffic backed up, where to park, where to sit, and where to celebrate afterwards. You may also have had to design a strategy for where to meet up with after this ceremony is over and decide on what restaurant to go to for dinner. None of your choices and compromises need put a damper on the event. And I hope you will all end the day pleased with the way you have designed it. Your career after graduation can itself be viewed as a design problem. Hopefully, you will have several opportunities among which to choose. Some of you may have your choices constrained by geographical preferences or salary needs. You may end up compromising by choosing a well-paying job in a less desirable location or a slightly poorer paying job in a fabulous location. Whatever you do, I hope you will be happy with your choice. But chances are you will not be completely satisfied, for you will have had to make choices under constraints and so have had to compromise. Whatever the reason, job dissatisfaction is something that comes to many people throughout their career. So sometime down the line, you might face another design problem, to find a new job. You will be older and presumably wiser, and you will no doubt work under different constraints. You may have children then, which will mean taking into account school districts and other factors that were not important when you were childless. But every design problem has a solution, albeit not a perfect one. And you will find a new job that suits your needs and wants at the time. Few, if any, jobs, like few, if any, designs, can be considered perfect. Little annoyances will always be popping up, like the little bugs that develop in the best of designs. Sometimes designs outright fail. Your job might become so unbearable that you have to quit before you get fired. Designers are used to such failures. It's not that they expect their designs to fail, for the goal of design is to obviate failure. But we all realize that failure is always a possibility. Engineers have two extreme views about failure. On the one extreme are the engineers who cannot bear the thought of it happening. And so their designs are often conservative to a fault. They take no chance whatsoever, and their designs reflect that. Conservative designs are to daring designs as glass boxes are to Frank Gehry buildings. They might both function as concert halls, but only the latter can be music itself. You can build your career as a glass box that reflects the organic music halls and soaring skyscrapers surrounding it, or you can yourself try to build it as one of those masterpieces. The former is usually the quicker and safer way, while the latter generally takes lots more time and involves much more risk. But if architects and engineers and other designers did not take chances, our built environment would be static and boring. It is made dynamic and exhilarating by the likes of Frank Gehry and Bruce Graham and Fosler Khan and you, by leaders rather than followers. Among the responsibilities conferred by a quality education is a call to leadership. Your education has prepared you to be a leader in your field and in the society in which you will work. In positions of leadership, you will be involved with decisions, design decisions, on a regular basis. You can take those decisions as conservatively or as daringly as you wish. But the choices you make will affect not only your own career and your immediate surroundings, but also the quality of life of those associated with you and the society in which we all live. Whatever you do, be leaders. Take the education that you have received here at Harvey Mudd and design a future that will make you and us proud and happy. You have been prepared to do just that. Good luck to you all as you go forward to design and redesign your careers and the world. Congratulations and Godspeed.
Well, thank you, Dr. Petrowski, for honoring and inspiring us by your presence here today, by the course of your distinguished career, and by your remarks so pertinent to this group of graduates. Now, last week, the Board of Trustees received a resolution from the faculty to grant degrees to the members of the class of 2004. The Board approved that resolution unanimously. And I call upon Dr. Weddick, Dean of Faculty, to present the candidates. Sheldon? Will the Bachelor of Science candidates of the class of 2004 please rise? Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the faculty, it is my very great pleasure to present the candidates who have successfully completed the requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Science. Upon recommendation of the faculty and the Board of Trustees of Harvey Mudd College, I confer on you the degree of Bachelor of Science with all the rights, privileges, responsibilities appertaining thereto. Brian Charles Humphrey. <laughs> Zamir Lauji. Heather Elizabeth Lane. Zach Andre. Kevin Hayes Andrew. Eric Owen Angel. Allison Esther Ald. Robert Hopkins Bailey. Melissa Jean Bannister. Catherine Marie Bartlett. Ariel E. Barton. Aaron Becker. Paul Frederick Bente IV. <laughs> Brett Bissinger. <laughs> Ethan Wesley Bodnerick. <laughs> Dina Joy Bodzen. <laughs> Zoe A. Buckelhide. <laughs> Brian Ashby Brenhog. Heather Margaret Bryan. Allison Elizabeth Burse. Ryan Scott Carpenter. William Young Chang. Joseph George Shachelsky. Pilan Chin. Candace Church. Edward Grant Clifford. Evan Bruce Kohick. Lindsay Michelle Crowell. Calvin Michael Curtis. James Darpinian. Charles Andrew Davis. Leonardo Andres Del Campo. Kenneth William Dye. Brant Erickson. Jorge Orlando Escobar. Jose Luis Espinosa. Kevin Michael Esfeld. <laughs> Melissa M. Fedorovich. <laughs> Matthew A. Furlow. <laughs> Ian Robert Farrell. 
Jessica A. Fisher. Laura K. Fisher. Leslie Fletcher. Rachel Gabor. David Jonathan Gabler. Robert Philemon Gabler. Nikhil Giwala. David Francis Gleick. Yevgeny A. Goldus. David Jonathan Grison. Andrew T. Greer. Rose Mary Hakim. Aja Marie Hammerly. Eric Thomas Harley. Shane Robert Hawk. Edward Peter He. Emily A. Hennage. Thomas E. Hennage. Stephen Alexander Boyd Hickman. Jessica Marie Hoover. Michelle Lynn Horter. River Leah Hutchison. Wan Kim Kwong. Tanya Brooke Eisnogel. Aaron Cole Jacobs. Colin William Jamat. Sharon Sue Young Jin. Laura M. Konofsky. Leslie K. Karp. Warren Patrick Kassenstein. Alexis Lee Kachansky. Stephen Colthammer. Jason Comedina. Kyle Yatsutami Kondo. George Kwan. Valerie Christina Lake. Lai Leo. Robert George Law. Esther Suhan Lee. Jean Y. Lee. Song Un Lee. Elizabeth Lee Sue. Andrew S. Lim. Alice Liu. Matthew Joseph Livianu. Renee Logan. Dwayne Lowe. Rachel Joy Lovick. Janet Louie. Stephen Thomas McVicker. Elizabeth Jean Maine. Daniel Eric Marley. Tara Lane Martin. 
Ryan Mashiyama. Charles Bruce Matlack. Jeremy Benjamin Bowie McCoy. Tyrell Matthew McQueen. Debbie Kathleen Maduna. Adrian Matthew Mettler. Elizabeth Milan. Keith Miyaka. Andrew J. Mugler. Benjamin Nahir. Gabriel Benjamin Neer. Jessica Lee Nelson. Mark J. Nelson. Eileen Ng. Du Nguyen. Hubert Yen Nguyen. Andrew Gerard Niedemeyer. Aileen Nugid. Corey Ryan O'Connor. Tatsuya Kellen Oye. Christina S. Oros. Joshua Lee Paget. Kevin William Pang. Amanda Rose Parmalee. Mary Elizabeth Peter. Juliet Rose Peterson. Gregory Scholerman Pomeran. Alexander B. Popkin. Evan Scott Porter. Sarah Ann Price. Brian John Putnam. Quan Quach. Christopher Brian Robb. Nikhil Reddy. Tamara Weying Reamer. Pamela Marie Reddig. Michael Reynolds. Erica Ann Rice. Kit T. Rodolfa. Brent Tony Rojo. Courtney F. Rotstan. Jesse Thomas Ruderman. Michelle Chiyoko Sakai. Jeffrey Matthew Sherpels. Natalie Swanson Shomer. Matthew C. Schultz. Matthew George Seaton. Kim Schultz. Sean Skelly. 
Damian Christopher Small. Joshua Daniel Smallman. Darcy Snowden. Lydia Son. Keith Ryan Stevens. Daniel Satoya. Eric W. Swope. Jordan A. Taggart. Waylee Tam. Adele Tamboli. Nicholas E. Taylor. Michael Sturgis Turkovitz. Creighton Thomas. Alexis H. Utvich. Philip Stephen Vigdal. Anand Vimuri. Michael Daniel Vrabel. Elizabeth M. Walsh. Diana Christine Warden. Jeremiah Levi Watson. Lisa M. White. Stephanie Kwai Jung Wong. Jenny J. Shu. Alexander Yip. Andrew O'Connor Cole. Join me in one big round of applause for the class of 2004. Graduates we honor today have achieved a new status at the college, that of Harvey Mudd College alumni. And here to welcome you to that august assemblage is Howard DeShong from the class of 89, president of the Alumni Association. Howard. Hello, fellow alumni. The first thing I want to say to you is congratulations. You've worked long and hard to get here, and if you've made it this far, you're definitely deserving of all of the rewards that you'll surely receive. I'm here to officially welcome you to the Harvey Mudd College Alumni Association and to encourage you to use the resources it has developed for your benefit. The association's purpose is straightforward. Its mission statement reads, the mission of the Harvey Mudd College Alumni Association, whose members are an enduring and permanent constituency of Harvey Mudd College is to provide a liaison and foster fellowship between the alumni of HMC and the college community as a whole. Additionally, the association will provide support for Harvey Mudd College in achieving and promoting the college's mission while advancing the reputation of the college and its alumni. Now you're probably asking yourself the question, why would I want to stay involved and participate in Mudd's Alumni Association? There are a number of reasons to be an active member. They include receiving notification of professional, academic, and social networking opportunities. Well, thank you, Howard, for being with us here today and for your remarks to the class of 2004. I normally keep my concluding comments at commencement pretty light, 
since by this time in the ceremony you're ready to celebrate. But this particular year at Harvey Mudd College suggests a more serious approach. The events we have shared together these past months demand, or better yet, inspire introspection. So I ask you to bear with me for a few moments as we consider, and yes, even celebrate, some of what we have learned together. Not a college steeped in the study of science and technology, it can be easy to lose sight of social issues. Yet it is my firm belief, reinforced by our mission statement, that such issues deserve our focus as much as any new advance in science, mathematics, or engineering. The technological betterment of the human condition will be meaningless if racism, fear, social injustice, or raw ignorance remain. Now this last semester of your careers here at MUD has involved some very distressing events. The past four months have been a time of revelation and reflection for us all. What had been invisible was suddenly unmasked and emotions long buried were given new light. We were forced, almost unwillingly, to look in the mirror and see something we didn't want to see, that the history of racism in this country and the feelings that that racism provokes are not gone not eradicated from our land or from our campus. Such ugliness still breathes not only in America, but here in Claremont. Yet there has been a silver lining to these days of fear and anger. The response by the majority of our community has been an inspiration and is leading to new resolve. Whether the events of this spring were driven by ignorance or something worse, whether they were real or a hoax, doesn't negate the very real emotions they engendered, nor does it diminish the positive reaction of this community. In many ways, the class of 2004 has been given an opportunity to see yourselves and your work here at Harvey Mudd College in a broader context than previous classes. As you leave here, you will not just be walking off into the world with a great deal of knowledge about your course of study, you will also walk out the door as human beings who have witnessed a community in crisis, reacting to incredibly disturbing events. And I urge you to make good use of the knowledge and empathy that these events have sparked. I graduated from college in 1959, as our country was on the verge of a long overdue and turbulent change in the area of civil rights. I wanted to believe that we had made great strides in eradicating social injustice during those subsequent years. And I do believe much was achieved at great cost to many individuals. But if 2004 has eliminated anything to me, it is that some things cannot be fixed by a single generation. Racism, ignorance, hate, and fear are deep and troubling issues which cannot be magically changed by legislation or good intentions. Such things are only changed one person at a time. The best and brightest of each generation has a responsibility to work toward the betterment of our world. We must all, each of us, ask what we can do individually and collectively to further the efforts of previous generations. Perhaps more than anything, we should listen to the voices we have heard this spring and realize the importance of the dialogue that was begun. I ask the class of 2004 to consider all that has happened here and to ask yourselves what you can do, in fact, what you must do, to move us further along on the path to creating a world free of fear and hate. The future will be defined by how willing we are to understand each other, and even more important, how willing we are to act upon that understanding. Only through compassion and empathy not raw intellect alone, can we build a truly better world. Now as this 46th commencement draws to a close, on behalf of our Michael Shanahan, Chair of the Harvey Mudd College Board of Trustees, the other trustees, our faculty, staff, alumni, and friends, and most of all your parents and friends here assembled, I wish you good luck and Godspeed. Ladies and gentlemen, the 46th annual commencement exercises of Harvey Mudd College are now concluded. Please remain at your places until the academic procession is passed, and then join us for the reception on the Campus Center lawn.
Thank you all for being here with us today to honor these magnificent young people. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.